Thank you all for joining us um, at the Texas State Women Entrepreneurship Founder Series kickoff. Uh, this is brought to you by the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship here at Texas State and Div Inc. Uh, my name is Shannon Wigum. I'm an, a an associate professor and co-director of the Texas State Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which serves as a nexus of connectivity across the university to really educate, equip, and engage um, all of our university and the community with the necessary skills, experiences, mindset, and other resources uh, for innovators and entrepreneurs to bring new ideas to life. The Women Entrepreneurship Founder Series is really an evolution of many years of Women Entrepreneurship Week events that were started at Texas State by Drs. Jennifer Irvin and Jana Menifee. Since getting together over a week-long set of events is not currently possible, we have pivoted to an online weekly series of interviews with company founders uh, designed to motivate em emerging entrepreneurs, um, many of whom may be our students, uh, and really support an inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, by one, addressing stereotypes about what entrepreneurship and what an entrepreneur looks like, uh, two, by engaging in dialogue and factors that impact female and other underrepresented um, entrepreneurs, and three, by listening and learning from each other. With sharing our stories, we share our voices and really ultimately uh, can have some impact and change. I am delighted uh, to be the host for today's kickoff. Uh, because we have a fantastic lineup of women founders, entrepreneurs, and educators uh, to share their knowledge, their insights, and their experiences uh, with us. You will hear about research that is tracking women entrepreneurship trends around the world from our keynote speaker. We have a panel of experts who will discuss the value of an entrepreneurial mindset, and together we will build upon our networking skills in this COVID-induced virtual world uh, where we know connecting is a little bit more difficult than it used to be. Um, neither the Founder Series or the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship would be possible without the support and commitment from our um, president of the university, Dr. Denise Trouth, and our provost, Dr. Jean Bourgeois. I am Delighted that Dr. Bourgeois is able to be here with us today, and I will turn it over to him to say a few words and introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Shannon. Texas State University is home to bold creative minds where we use new technology and hands-on experiences to prepare a new generation of innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders. We view training in innovative and entrepreneurial thinking as a means to foster an intellectual curiosity and a confidence that inspires creative solutions and drives positive change in any context, whether it's launching a new business, empowering change as an entrepreneur, or even as inspiring social change. We're committed to bringing the people, that is students, faculty, mentors, and industry experts together in the newly formed Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship to ensure that all of our students have access to entrepreneurial training, skills and experiences in order to better prepare them for careers in today's rapidly changing world. Events like this one today enable us to connect and grow our culture of innovation and entrepreneurship across our university and out into our community. Thank you all for being here and for joining us for the Women Entrepreneurship Founder Series kickoff. And please allow me to give a shout out back to Shannon and also to Dan Roy, who are spearheading our new center and bringing it to life. Well, now it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Amanda Elam. She is the CEO and co-founder of Galaxy Diagnostics, which is an early stage medical diagnostics company in the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. She also serves as a research fellow at the Diana International Research Institute at Babson College, where her research is focused on the application of sociological theories to the study of business startup, innovation, and growth across countries and social groups, including gender, ethnicity, and immigrant status. Her research has been published in top business journals, global reports, edited volumes, and a book entitled Gender and Entrepreneurship, 
a multi-level theory and analysis. In addition to her business leadership and academic research, she serves as a business advisor to a number of life sciences startups and international non-governmental organizations and appears regularly on panels and podiums at industry and global research conferences. We are delighted to have her and our other panelists with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elam. Very excited um, to have this opportunity to share with you all some of the latest findings in, on women's entrepreneurship um, and certainly some of my insights and conclusions that I've gathered um, over the last uh, few decades studying women entrepreneurs and the process of starting and growing businesses. So um, to start with, you know, this is about supercharging women entrepreneurs. A lot of my goals in the research is to really understand uh, what women entrepreneurs need, what they're already doing, what they've already got figured out. Um, I've been very involved in the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Program, or GEM, as we call it. It's a global research program where we study entrepreneurs, men and women, at the earliest stages of business. So when through nascency, um, through to uh, established businesses. And based on the last women's report that um, I co-authored, there are an estimated 252 million women around the world in the, the earliest stages of starting and growing businesses. And there are another 153 million women globally running established businesses. Um, these numbers are tremendous and they cert certainly speak to the enormous uh, contributions that women are having around the world. To kind of put this in comparative terms for you, um, about you know 10% of the women surveyed are involved in what we call total entrepreneurship activity. These very early stages, from ideation through uh, the first three years of launch, um, and really, it's you know women are participating in this early process at rates um, that aren't too different from men. Right, men are running 13 to to 14% around the world and women are over 10. And this is a trend that we see growing, especially as we see regions like the Middle East where women are starting um, businesses uh, faster and the gaps that we see here are closing. Um, so women are busy, they're starting and growing businesses and they're making a really tremendous impact as well. We have our, our data show that, um, you know, that, that women are starting and companies and commercializing really important innovations. So we have about a quarter of the, the women in these earliest stages describe what they're doing is, as distinctly different from anything else available on the, on the market. Um, we have about uh, two and a half percent of the women entrepreneurs um, have businesses with greater than 20 employees. So mis most businesses are, are solo firms. Um, but we do see women starting and growing uh, big companies and employing a lot of people. Uh, we have women are very active in exports. This is actually internationalization. This is actually one of the areas where we see women are almost at parity with men, just as likely to start businesses where exports are an important part of what they're doing. We also have, um, you know, twenty percent of these women entrepreneurs are uh, have very high growth expectations. And, and the percentages for men aren't much higher. Um, so of the entrepreneurs with high growth expectations, again, women are about one out of three. Um, and women are also very active as investors around the world as well. Um, again, it's 3.4% you know, of the women surveyed um, reported having invested recently. And for men, it's just slightly over 5%. So it isn't that different. So I'm presenting this and I was thinking about how to talk about what we're doing. So much of the conversation out there around women entrepreneurs these days is about how we face these challenges of negative stereotypes. And, and one of the big questions researchers have is why do these stereotypes persist? But I don't think it's, it's particularly obvious to a lot of people, right? There's this uh, sense that you know, that, that women have a harder time being taken seriously. Um, and, uh, and so I guess the question for me as a sociologist is how do we explain the persistence of these beliefs that women aren't as competent as business leaders or we don't make um, good entrepreneurs? 
And so in sociology, we really, there, there's the persistence of ideology is often tied to what we call structural patterns. So that is, you know, some facts that people use um, as they go through life, their experiences somehow confirm their beliefs. So what types of structural evidence do we have to support these, uh, what we call the female underperformance hypothesis? Um, one of them is that around the world, you know, women are much more likely to run solo businesses um, than men. Now here we're just looking at the earliest stages of businesses and what I want you to see in this graph from the GEM data is that um, it's declining for women. So while globally, women are more likely to be running starting companies alone and, and in Canada, but in the US, men are actually more likely to be starting companies alone. So we know in the US, 70% of, of uh, businesses are uh, sole proprietorships and that for women, that number looks more like um, 90%, for men-owned businesses, it's more like 60%, um, but it's changing. Right? Women are out there starting companies with others. Another structural reason why this idea that women uh, are underperform in business comes from the fact that women are more likely to start businesses in industries where uh, the, barrier, the competitive barriers are uh, a lot higher. So there's high competition, there's low margins, might be easy to start a business in these industries, um, but it's very difficult. And, and small businesses tend to characterize a lot of these industries. So if we're looking at health, education, wholesale retail, hospitality, some of these industries, for example, that were hardest hit in COVID, um, that, is, um, that is one of the reasons why women, uh, it's attributed to women, but it's really about the industry or the marketplace where these women are starting and growing businesses. And then finally, when it, one of the point I think everybody needs to know when you're going into this is that when it comes to VC financing, you know, we know that women represent less than 2% of women-led businesses represent less than 2% of the businesses that receive venture capital financing. But look at this, if you look at where the global venture capital is going, it's going almost all to software. And ICT is one of those industries where women globally see a very low representation. <laughs> so, so we aren't being funded, but it's in part because we don't start the types of businesses that tend to get funded. Um, so these are structural factors that contribute to uh, what I believe is, is the myth of female underperformance. When we do studies and we compare women directly to men starting and growing the same types of businesses um, at the same stages or sizes of business growth, we find that, that they perform comparably. So myth busting is important and you all need to know that you know, women are awesome, really awesome entrepreneurs, really excellent business leaders and comparable to their male peers when we compare them directly. Another issue that comes up um, when we're looking at research is this whole idea of how are we defining um, the population of businesses that we're looking at. One of the big issues is the debates right now internationally um, is how we're defining what it means to be women owned or, or should we be looking at businesses that are women led? Um, this is, a, I think, a really important distinction for us when we're thinking about um, women-owned businesses because, because a lot of the programs out there designed to support women entrepreneurs are focused on businesses where you have women, uh, the business is owned by 51% or more by, by women. So that founder equity is 51% is female. Um, and that's problematic because we have two, like we have two and a half million businesses in the United States that are jointly owned between men and women, like evenly owned. And so we're not even, those businesses can't even compete for, uh, they might be going after female markets, they might have a female CEO, um, but they don't have access to a lot of the programming and support. And that's particularly important when we think about what we are missing if we're ignoring jointly owned businesses or what we're missing if we're not also considering you know, female controlled or female led firms. Um, we may be missing businesses again that are targeting uh, 
female markets with female products um, and services that would be of interest to female consumers. We're also missing businesses in the high technology sector where we're seeing women have made some of the strongest gains in terms of, uh, you know, access, serving in, on the board or C, holding a C-level role or, um, you know, serving as the scientists in the lab. Um, and you might recognize in, in this image, the lady on the left, <laughs> and this is my team. And this is a, pro we're, we're one of those businesses where um, we have a lot of strong female leadership, um, but because we're, we're jointly owned and because we've received an investment, um, you know, our, we don't meet the term, we don't meet the, the standards for that 51% of female equity. So when we're looking at gender parity or when you're out there and navigating gender parity, I think it's really important to keep in mind that a lot of the aggregate data, a lot of the statistics that are thrown away around are not apples to oranges, um, right? I, it's important to look a little more closely to look at what types of definitions are being used, um, what industries are being included in the analysis or are you, are, the, the writers not controlling for industry? Are they looking broadly? Um, how large are these firms in terms of employees or sales? Um, profitability, because again, profitability, sales, the size of the business in terms of number of employees are off, is often tied to the industry in which that business is, is located. Um, and, and then again, also with the investment dollars raised, it's often tied to the interest investors have in a particular market sector. Um, uh, and, and the same goes for return on investment or return on assets. These are statistics that tend to be tied to the, the type of business that the entrepreneur is starting. So um, why does this matter in a really practical way? Well, we see reports put out all the time that you know, we, we all consume and one of them is this, uh, is this uh, Boston Consulting Group report that came out in 2019 that left me kind of, um, you know, thinking really about um, what they were trying to estimate here. So they said that if women and men participated equally as entrepreneurs, global GDP could rise by approximately three to six percent, boosting the global economy by two and a half trillion to five trillion. And <laughs> And it's a really, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a definitely a call to arms, right? A call to action to say, hey, we need to do something to support women entrepreneurs. Women entrepreneurs are having a big impact. They're making a big contribution. The problem is that when you actually look at um, where this calculation comes from or the structures that are behind it, um, it's not clear that we'll ever reach gender parity, right? Because what we would need in order to do that is that the same number of women would have to start businesses in the same industries that men do, and they would have to grow them to the same levels and the same size, right? Using bootstrap or investments raised or access to debt financing. And, um, and I don't know, you know, that's a different goal when it comes to programming and policy and social change than, uh, you know, encouraging people to start and grow businesses based on a passion that they have um, for a product or service um, or an innovation they want to bring to market in an area that they're, that they're really passionate about. Um, so this kind of brings us back to this idea of, you know, why do stereotypes matter so much? And they do matter a lot. We do want to shift them. We do want to change them. Um, and they matter because they define the credibility that women have as business leaders. So we need to get more of this apples to apples kind of research out there so that those people who underestimate women understand that they're actually hurting themselves. Investors should be investing in female leadership and female led businesses um, because there's, they're strong leaders. And if they are operating under this faulty assumption that women somehow underperform their male peers, then they're missing really great investment opportunities. It's also important because it actually affects us as entrepreneurs, right? It undermines our confidence. Um, and it may dissuade us from looking for opportunities, what we call alertness or opportunity recognition. It may increase our sense of our fear of failure, a sense that if we were to fail, 
you know, we'd have a lot more to lose um, than other people because how many chances are we going to get if we have low credibility? Um, and it may also dissuade us from um, effectively mobilizing resources, you know, um, asking for what we need. It might make us think, well, we don't have the credibility, no one's going to give us a loan, no one's going to invest in our business, no one's going to help us, and we never even ask because we sort of self-select out of it. So these stereotypes matter a lot because they can lead to self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, they can lead to people judging us in unfair ways, and they can also lead to us changing our behavior um, in ways. And, and I really think that women entrepreneurs should feel limitless and that we should feel you know, that, that, um, that there are people out there who are going to believe in us and are going to support us. And after, you know, 12 years of leading my own early stage company, I would say that that has been one of the most positive surprises about being in the driver's seat is, um, you know, that my gender hasn't mattered very much, that what has really mattered is the decisions I was making with my business and leading my people well and, and thinking strategically and well um, about my business. And so that brings us to where I wanna leave this presentation with you all. And that's this idea of how do we transcend stereotypes? And I think the, the answer again is be smart about, you know, be smart about gender, understand, have a really keen gender acumen, understand that gender is a social marker um, and that it is based on these aggregate gender trends, right? But it doesn't necessarily define who you are um, or, or you may not even be defined by your specific circumstances, right? Just because you're a mother doesn't mean you're going to have a harder time starting and growing a business. Um, just because you uh, grew up in a poor neighborhood um, doesn't mean, or a resource scarce context, as we like to say in research, it doesn't mean that you can't effectively start and grow a research, a business. You may have to work a little harder for resources. You may have to, uh, you know, work harder on your networking and finding mentors, but you can do it. So I guess three point, points of advice I'm going to offer based on my uh, experience. One of the reasons I'm super excited about the programming that Shannon and team are launching with the female founder series. And that is that we need those successful role models. We, and they have, to be, they have to be tangible. So take inspiration from the stories you hear from women who are doing it now and are doing it well. Um, and, and also go broadly, look for inspiration in other people's stories, whether they're female or not, but people who are doing it well in your specific industry. You know, that's where some of the best strategy is going to come from is how can, you know, how can I achieve in this industry? You can get a lot of inspiration from how people do uh, start and grow businesses in other industries and apply it to your in in industry as well. So do, do think broadly um, about who those trailblazers are, who you study and, and uh, figure out what their strategic um, perspectives are and what their tactics are. Um, and effectively just surround yourself with mentors and peer support, these people who, whose stories resonate with you, you know, connect with them um, and learn from them and share with them because they'll learn from you as well. Um, and I think really importantly, we get a lot of bad news when we're really from these studies that say there is a lot of gender parity. I want you to remember that it's complicated and don't be stuck in history. Don't get, don't get trapped by history, your own history or the history of others. Um, because the truth is that nobody ever judges anyone just by their gender, right? We judge each other by how much, uh, how we talk and how we dress and how we present ourselves and how knowledgeable we are. And these are characteristics, by the way, that, you know, vary by the type of business that we're in. These pictures here, are all successful women entrepreneurs that appeared in the last GEM Women's Report. Um, they're successfully starting and growing businesses in countries around the world. They're following their passion and they're, they're uh, you know, developing products and services and, and meeting market needs and they're doing it very effectively and we should take inspiration 
uh, from these stories and understand that all of these women have come overcome significant challenges um, to realize their dreams. And then finally, you know, enjoy the journey and don't worry too much about, um, you know, a, about whether you can do it or not, because you need to take confidence from your ability to figure things out. If there's one hallmark of entrepreneurship, it's the uncertainty, right? It's the roller coaster. It's the constantly not knowing what is around the next corner or when you're going to need to pivot. You're reading the market. You're navigating, um, navigating the ocean. You're exploring new terrain, however you like to think about it. But you should take confidence in, from the fact that you have what it takes to, to figure out the challenges and to, to find the next opportunity. Um, be resourceful. Although we have a lot of research that shows some of the most successful entrepreneurs are what we call practical optimists, right? They're grounded, but they're continuously optimistic that they're going to figure things out, that the new resources are going to be around the, the corner, they're persistent, um, and, and that kind of optimism and sort of practical sensibility really helps them make things happen. Um, and again, check your own assumptions. You know, don't assume that the world isn't going to be helpful to you. Assume that you're going to be able to, to get what you need. Assume people are out there and interested in helping you. That contributes to a different type of self-fulfilling prophecy that could really benefit with you. And finally, uh, ladies, always ask. If you need something, ask. Um, one of the things that my research has really shown is that you know, women are reticent about mobilizing certain types of resources across their social ties. And one of those resources we're really cautious about is money. Um, and if you're in an industry with a type of business where you have to raise outside investment, you're going to have to get really good at asking for money. Um, and so get comfortable with that. Always ask. Um, and with that... I'm going to say thank you very much for your attention and your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Elam. Uh, we, we genuinely appreciate you uh, providing us with, with both knowledge, optimism, um, regarding the, the progress and promise of women entrepreneurs. Um, your message is one of hope, change, and transcendence, and uh, we really do appreciate that. Um, we have probably time for just one quick question uh, that is coming in through the chat. Um, when looking at the industry sectors, what do you think the cause is of gender disparity in different industries? Could it be educational background, individual interests, or other reasons? And I, I brought this one up because uh, certainly in the COVID world, healthcare, um, where an awful lot of women do dominate uh, healthcare decisions and healthcare uh, control, and, and we likely will see an awful lot of women-led businesses in healthcare. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I Please. think that's a really great question, um, and it varies a lot by industry. So I'll tell you, though, one of the problems in ICT, for example, where we see the lowest female participation rates um, in terms of participating as an entrepreneur, the lowest startup rates, um, we need more women in STEM. We need more women who, who uh, you know, are learning how to code and who are taking that expertise and, and starting business with it. So there are, there's a rising number of women working in STEM, but it doesn't necessarily translate into business leadership. So we need, that's, that's one thing. In other areas, women are already kicking ass. I mean, in hospitality and fashion, and uh, you know, a lot of consumer products. This is one area where women are really good. Um, in tech, we're seeing femtech you know, really happen. And then there's another world of startups around investment. Women are starting investment firms and, and not just to invest in female owned companies, but starting uh, investment firms focused on this idea of impact investing and, uh, and and sometimes, you know, specific market areas like, like femtech, where it's specifically technologies for um, healthcare um, for women. Uh, so I think that's a big part of it. I think the other thing that the research really helps us understand 
about the way women start and grow businesses is that with men, business ownership tends to have a normal curve. In other words, it's sort of middle income men who are starting and growing businesses. Um, whereas for women, it's bimodal. So it's the poorest women and the wealthiest, most educated women who are actually starting businesses. And that's a phenomenon that, uh, you know, that we're trying to unpack. Um, I think the, the poorest, the income, the poorest women are not just women who live below the poverty line. It's also, uh, you know, mothers who uh, want something flexible or part-time. And increasingly we're seeing, you know, men pursue that as well. Um, so that was a long winded answer, but, but I think it really, we really do have to go in and study it industry by industry. I really do appreciate all of your time today. And if you, you have a few more minutes, maybe you can stick around and help answer some of the questions that have come through the chat that we didn't get a chance uh, to do here. But thank you so much, Dr. Elam, for being right. with us. We really appreciate it. It was thank wonderful you. to hear it. At Texas State, um, we view entrepreneurship uh, in a, a very broad way. Um, it's traditionally associated with launching new businesses, but if we broaden that perspective, we really can view entrepreneurship as an essential life skill um, that extends far beyond the ability to start a new business. Um, we believe that it is really within the mindset of entrepreneurship that empowers change, inspires discovery, and creates value regardless of the field or the context with which it's being applied. Um, I'm happy to uh, present this amazing panel of entrepreneurs and educators to, to discuss more about uh, the value of that entrepreneurial mindset for all careers and all disciplines, regardless of what your major is or what your field of expertise or whether you are working inside or outside of a small or large business. Um, the moderator for our discussion is Texas State's own Dr. Amy Roundtree. Uh, welcome, Dr. Roundtree. Thank you. She has extensive experience and research in STEM communication and ethics. She's also a past participant um, at the Texas State South by Southwest Innovation Lab, which highlights faculty and student-led innovations, uh, which have real-world practical applications. Welcome, Dr. Roundtree, and thank you for being uh, the moderator for our panel. I will go ahead and turn it over to you and let you introduce our panelists. A pleasure. Thank you all for inviting me. Um, let me first start by um, uh, giving you an overview, a brief overview of uh, our, uh, the amazing accomplishments of our three panelists. Uh, I guess I'll start with Amelia Schaffner, who is the director of the Emory Goizeta Business School Center for, on, uh, on, for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. She's responsible for developing the school's entrepreneurial culture, thinking and initiatives, uh, and partnering with students, faculty, and alumni in the ecosystem of investors of venture capitalists and organizations. Um, I also want to introduce you, uh, so greetings, um, Amelia, looking forward to having a conversation with you. Next, I'd like to introduce you all to Claudette Blythe, who is the founder and CEO of Modern uh, Tribes Events. Um, Claudette is the founder and CEO of this boutique of events uh, design and marketing agency that helps small businesses and nonprofits leverage events to inc increase the visibility and their, and their bottom line. I wanted to um, welcome you, uh, uh, Claudia. Yeah, it, you can say Claudette, thank you. <laughs> I, I want you to make a decision. Yeah, you tell me. I'm here yes. to listen and learn. So Claudette. Yes, welcome. Claudette, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce you all to Brooke. Let me give you a little bit about the amazing work that Brooke, uh, Brooke Turner does as Vice President of Programs and uh, at Dim Divinic. I'm, or Divinic, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm mispronouncing it. Div but Brooke, please correct me. <laughs> Div Inc. Thanks for having us. Div Inc. Div Inc. I see. You know that clever names for clever uh, organizations. So she has a background in marketing, sales, education, and programs in high tech, public education, and startups. She is now an executive program director for Div Inc. 
and she leads teams and guides startups through highly intensive tech accelerators and portfolio company programs to close the get to close the gap between early stage entrepreneurs and the resources they need to build high growth scalable companies. All right, now I have only um, touched a, a small portion of the amazing work that you all do. Um, and I'm sure that you'll share more about your professional experience and, and the, um, your, uh, as, as entrepreneurs, as professionals in, the, in this um, venue, and then also everything else you've got. But first let's start. Um, and also I wanna let everyone watching know that we're gonna open up the floor to Q&A um, a little later. Um, so please post questions and I will be wrangling them as we, as we speak. But I wanted to start um, by letting each of you tell us a little bit more about your background and your journey to teaching entrepreneurs on being entrepreneur uh, and also or and or on being an entrepreneur yourself. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll go in order. We'll go Amelia and then we'll go Brooke and, Cla and Claudette. We're gonna go ABC <laughs> in alphabetical order. So uh, Amelia, why don't you kick off by telling us a little bit about your background and your journey to teaching entrepreneur or being one yourself. Great. So my entrepreneurial experience is more indirect, but I did start when I was in college. I did work at a startup and it was an amazing experience because it kind of shaped my curiosity about what could be rather than going through a predefined pathway. So before that experience, I thought, you know, there was just one way. You go to school, you graduate, and you go into the business world. But that kind of opened up that there are actually multiple pathways. Um, so, and that's where my career went into. I ended up going into consulting where I spent most of my career. But there within consulting, I got uh, interested in innovation. And so how companies actually um, create new ideas and implement them and so forth. And so I spent a lot of time on that side of things. And then um, over the last few years, I'm at the university at uh, Emory Guzuera Business School, where I actually uh, lead our uh, Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And this is where I kind of brought together those two past experiences. Uh, helping students really look beyond sort of the marked, you know, yellow path, brick path, essentially, and kind of saying, you can choose your own adventure. You can actually uh, do both things. And uh, that's what I'll, I'll, well, we can talk more about that, but that's a brief background. Thanks, Amy. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll go, B. Brooke, will you tell us a bit about either being an entrepreneur yourself or helping teach entrepreneurs? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting the way, Amelia, you say um, you kind of stumble on it or it's not a straightforward path. And that's probably true for so many of us. My journey to entrepreneurship and now teaching entrepreneurs or uh, facilitating their journey uh, is definitely, you know, not traditional. I started my career as a high school English teacher um, and moved into high tech engineering firm, um, Fortune 500 company. That's another story for another time. But during my decade long stint in the corporate world is where I really uh, honed my entrepreneurial mindset. And so I know we're gonna talk about that later, but whether you're in um, education or corporate or the startup ecosystem, looking for opportunities for innovation, looking for opportunities uh, to solve problems. And that's what I did through uh, my tech career, which led me to starting my own uh, company called Quaddle, K-W-A-D-D-L-E to support uh, after school, out of school enrichment and learning. Um, as a working step parent, it was a, a need that my family and I had. And then of course, all my colleagues around me. So I, I left the corporate career to, um, to try and solve that problem. And there are so many amazing companies doing that work now. It's been a really amazing to see that, um, that growth. Uh, through that journey uh, led me to Div Inc where they've been super supportive and I'll share more about Div Inc. Um, and we also have some amazing uh, alumni from our, our program here today. And so uh, I've had the opportunity to support them and they, as they supported me and I became their program director leading their accelerator program. And so that combination of my background in curriculum and instruction and education in high tech and in the startup world has been the perfect culmination to uh, put me where I am today. 
Thank you for sharing that. Now, Claudia, last but certainly not least, tell us a bit about being an entrepreneur and or um, training, teaching, mentoring entrepreneurs. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and amongst everybody that's doing so much amazing work. Um, my journey to get to this point started a lot like Amelia's and Brooke. Um, I started off, um, I went to college, you know, everybody's taught, you know, you go to college and, and you get on a path for your career. And so I did that. Um, I worked in the nonprofit arena for over 15 years. And um, they say that, you know, um, on average, social workers burn out around the 10th year. It's so true. It's so true. <laughs> but um, yeah, I found myself um, loving certain parts about my work um, as a social worker and not enjoying some other parts of it. And just really kind of came to this place in my life where I really wanted to do something that I really enjoy. I, I really wanted to be true to myself. And in that, I, I decided to go on this journey of self-discovery. And what I did was I learned that what I really enjoyed about my work was events and the networking and being able to help other people connect. Um, and so I kind of went on this journey in 2017 and it, it led me to this um, kind of culmination, if you will, of events. I, for five years, I taught myself um, website design, um, HTML, CSS. I taught myself um, digital marketing, just looking, you know, being very intentional about what is it that I really want and what, it, what excites me. And in, um, I started Modern Tribes in 2019 and I started off consulting. I started off doing consulting work and that kind of led me to understand um, this B2B space. So this business to business sales and really seeing that there was a need for services um, to and events, you know, in, in this day and age um, where uh, marketing has shifted and people are not just trying to go into a store and just purchase or make purchases or going to go get a service. They want to really connect with the business owners. They want to know um, what types of um, social activity are you doing. They want to know about you, right, with all this social media and stuff like that. But a lot of businesses uh, found some difficulty with trying to um, get that message across. And so that was the beginning of Modern Tribes. And um, I've, I've been, I haven't looked back since. I've enjoyed my journey and have been really blessed uh, to be able to do what I'm doing. I love the through line. There's so many through lines and just what you shared so far. And the two I heard were problems and um, solutions, right? Like a uh, part of it is passion too. You, you, you're identifying problems and seeing them as opportunities to create in a space. And then also you're leaning toward passion. Even that what you described, Claudia, about the burnout, these moments aren't just walls. They are these moments when you can pivot and become more inventive. So that said, let me ask a twofold question. I'm known for really complicated questions. So I want to know from all of you, and we'll start with Amelia, what does it mean to you to have an entrepreneurial mindset? So what does that even mean, entrepreneurial mindset? And then in what settings or environments do you see that being useful or important, that mindset? Amelia. Yeah, and that's obviously the million dollar question of this panel, but um, I think when I think about it, um, I think about uh, a quote that uh, Henry Ford had, it said, you know, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And to me, that sums it up a lot because entrepreneurs are about making things happen. So they're about uh, exploring the world, looking at like uh, Brooke mentioned, the problems that are out there and uncovering different ways of solving those problems, uh, but also being very um, uh, frugal 
with what they have available to them. And I think the frugality is the part that I'm really drawn to because a lot of times one thinks about large organizations, they have a lot of resources, they have a lot of people, they have a lot of time versus for an entrepreneur, that problem is pretty urgent and it needs to be addressed now. And it needs to be addressed with very little uh, funding and, with, uh, and it needs to be addressed yesterday. So I feel like that combination of things, like so that potential and desire to want to solve those problems and to have to solve them with very limited resources is huge. And I think, you know, you asked me that question was how do you see that uh, around in different places? I see that that is useful in any place of life. So it's useful whether you want to start a company whether you want to work in a larger organization, you're gonna be just much better set off if you're able to navigate with little resources, even if you have a lot of them. But it also honestly serves you individually as a person because it teaches you to live life like more entrepreneurially, you know, move around, be comfortable with that sort of uncertainty and limited uh, resources. If a pandemic hasn't taught us anything, it's about living in the unknown. So I, entrepreneurial mindset is, is absolutely important in that regard. So Brooke, would you like to share what is that entrepreneurial mindset and in what ways can it help? Yeah, absolutely agree with, uh, with you, Amelia. And the, the growth mindset, you know, so whatever context you're in that you're looking to learn and grow, but do something with it. Um, I, I definitely, I, I love to learn and I actually have to make sure that I take action because uh, I think that's the other half of it. You know, when we're, when we're hiring or when we are accepting entrepreneurs into our program, um, we ask, you know, are you a strategic thinker or, um, or the, you know, uh, we, we don't say the doer, but the agent, you know, gets things done. And I think so many people think that strategic is the right answer, but we need to know you're going to act. Um, and so I think that applies again, you know, I, I always use the examples of the education industry and the corporate and high tech world because those are the two industries I've been in the most, um, but they, that applies in the same place, you know, working with whether I'm working with high school students or college students, entrepreneurs, uh, or engineers at a high tech fortune 500 billion dollar company, it's the same thing. Let's think strategically with our limited resources and take the right action. And so I think you can apply that across the board. So the other thing that I uh, always look at is um, I think entrepreneurs see opportunities. And so, you know, sometimes they don't think of it as a problem, but it's like, oh, I actually think there's a better way to do that. Um, I think there's either, either more efficient or there's a community that's not being served or there is, um, you know, a, a, a opportunity that, Tradition, you know, I'll say traditional um, startup founders in the past haven't seen because it's not a part of their their world or their community. And so that opportunity to make um, progress, to to innovate, to make lives better, uh, is a huge part of that entrepreneurial mindset that you can apply whatever context you're in. Thank you, Claudia. Same question to you. What is that entrepreneurial mindset, and in what settings or environments can it be useful or important? Yeah, I. I totally agree with Amelia and Brooke on, um, on what that means. Um, I would just add to it. For me specifically, I would certainly say um, taking responsibility for your own journey. Um, what that looks like would be you understanding yourself. You know, um, I really learned that from my personal experience and my personal journey. You know, um, take the time to understand uh, what you really want. And that is coupled with the fact of knowing where the problem exists and if you're able to, you know, kind of come in and fill that gap, right? But there's also this component of servant leadership, you know, it's about being responsible and taking ownership of everything you do. That means every single decision that you make, you have to have that type of mindset to be an entrepreneur because whether you succeed or fail, you know, you're empowered because you're saying, hey, look, this was my choice. If I accept full responsibility for it, if it didn't do so well, then I also have the power to change it. I also have the power to pivot. That's our favorite word from 2020, right? So I also have the, the power to pivot. Um, and that servant leadership piece of it is so critical in my, in my opinion, just because you have a customer base, right? 
you're asking them for their trust. You're asking them um, to do, to lean on you for something, and you need to be able to take that seriously um, and provide a quality product and or service, right? So I think that those things are super important, just really understanding yourself, being able to accept full responsibility for your choices and, and not feel like that responsibility. Sometimes we hear respons responsibility and we are like, oh, oh, you know, that's, that's a heavy situation, right? But there's so much power in responsibility. So that's, that's what I think would be important as well, in addition to other things. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. So I'm going to actually circle back. You guys have shared a bit about your um, biography, a bit about how you are, where you are. Uh, I want you to drill a little deeper here. Uh, and the question is, did you always know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Now, for those of you who have your own companies, you're going to have to give us a little bit more about that defining moment that, that, that made it made that shift from wherever you were before to becoming an entrepreneur. And also for those of you who train um, uh, entrepreneurs, if you could share some of their stories and words of wisdom about that defining moment um, where um, you knew that you wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I think this is important too, because I know for all entrepreneurs, this is an interesting, uh, it's, a, it's a critical point, but I think also for women and for women uh, of color, it is equally uh, important. So I'm going to turn this actually, I'm going to reverse order. How about we start with you, Claudia, and then we'll go to Brooke and then Amelia. Absolutely. Um, well, like I said, I shared a little bit earlier. Um, I was in the nonprofit arena um, for about 15 years. And um, like I said, it was a little bit of burnout. It was, it was a lot of bureaucracy um, within the nonprofit arena. There's a lot of you know, grants and funding issues, and there's certain things that you can do and can't do and, and those types of things. But I won't say that that's necessarily what it was. I think that if I look and go back deeper, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I can think back to being a child. Now, I'm, I'm a bit older, so <laughs> we did not have the internet and, and, and all this cool stuff we have now. Um, it was, you know, I grew up in urban America. You know, I did not know very many um, entrepreneurs um, at all. Matter of fact, I can't even name one <laughs> that had a legit, you know, business, somebody that I could go and speak to about becoming an entrepreneur. What I was taught was, you know, you go to college, you know, you get a degree and you become a professional. You know, um, I heard that from my mother. I heard that from my community. I heard it from every teacher I ever had, um, that that was the path to um, kind of getting out of um, our environment. And that was the goal. And that was the goal that was drilled in, into me since I was a small child. So that's precisely what I did. You know, I went to college, I got three degrees. I went into a field where I saw the most need, which was social work in my, in my community. I felt like I could help people and I did that. Um, but although I heard a lot that, hey, you, sh you can grow up and you can be anything you want to be, you know, <laughs> I mean, there, there's this, I laugh because it's kind of funny and ironic, you know, yeah, you can be anything you want to be, but if you don't know what's out there, then how do you make the choice, right? Basically, your choices were a social worker, teacher, doctor, lawyer, something like that. But there's all this other stuff out there, right? So anyway, that kind of brought, brought me to the space that I was fast forward, um, you know, 20 years into my career, where I had to stop and think, is this really what I want to do? Or did I allow other people to choose for me what I wanted to do? And the answer was startling. It was frustrating. It was actually upsetting that I, I felt like I was leading somebody else's life. And that is when I said I intentionally um, decided to really seek out what I wanted to do. What did I love about my job? And can I extract that piece of it? In the nonprofit arena, you put on a lot of events, right? Because you're trying to highlight your program, 
or you're trying to bring in some funding and things like that. And so I love doing that. I got excited about that. I got excited about teaching. I did a lot of um, training and, and things like that. So I basically decided that I would extract those things and then go out here and find where I could use that in, in the real world, in a real world setting and make something out of that for myself, for myself. And so that is where, um, that's really where the journey began. That's when I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I'd always had that dream in my mind, like I said, when I was a kid, but I did not know how to get there. And so I had to put that away. You know, I felt like that was not something that was going to be for me. But now I'm able to realize that dream, you know, and it's, it's profound. It's, it's amazing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to amend my question because I think there's a really interesting question that emerged in Q&A that I want to tag on to this question. So I'm going to turn it to Brooke and then Amelia, but Claudia, if you have something else, please come back, circle back if, after Amelia, if there's more. So Sounds again, good. the question on the table is, um, how did you know? What was that moment when you're like, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be an entrepreneur? And the second a, a, a amendment I'd like to add is, there's a lot of risk associated with being an entrepreneur. And like you said, it's not just unfamiliarity, it's risk. And for those who want to be an entrepreneur and aren't quite seeing a vision of it because they have families, they have priorities, they have responsibilities, day-to-day -day bills, et cetera. What would you recommend? What advice or what can you uh, lend from your expert experience or from the experience of the entrepreneurs you mentor would it be, um, how do you manage those risks and how do you step into that arena even while maintaining uh, some of those responsibilities? Uh, so I'm going to turn to Brooke. I, I know I've just complicated the question. I'll turn to Brooke and Amelia, you're next. But uh, Claudia, if you want to chime in after, let me know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for the questions. Y'all keep them coming and we'll, I'm glad to work them into our answers. Um, thank you for adding that, Amy. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I never knew that I um, wanted to be an entrepreneur and I don't, uh, you know, similar to what uh, Claudia, you're talking about, it wasn't like it was those pictures that come up of doctor, lawyer, teacher. I mean, I became a teacher because my mom was a teacher and my aunt was a teacher. So it was like, okay, I guess I go to college and become a teacher. Um, granted, that was, um, that part of my career has been, that is the like, hardest and also best job I've ever done, even though I, I think I had crazy hard jobs after but it, it taught me and prepared me for everything after. Um, and, and some of the, those students are still in my life and, and those teacher, my colleagues are still some of my best friends decades later. Um, and so, but that mindset again of like, look, it's only looking back that I saw like even while teaching, you know, extremely limited budget and very low support, no system. I mean, I'm a teacher in Texas, like no system that's going to support me. So I had to, we had to figure it out on our own, um, use our own money and, and um, solve the problem for our customer of our students, you know, with all these inputs of um, the, you know, state mandates, federal mandates, budgets, district mandates, um, but each student's so different. How do you ensure that they thrive? So I think looking back, I knew that I was doing that. When I moved into the corporate world, you know, I was thinking like, oh, this is going to be way easier. <laughs> um, but I was a non-technical, non-engineer um, uh, employee at an all-engineering firm. And so I did it again. I'm like, okay, I see this opportunity or this um, problem. I'm going to solve it and eventually ran our entire global marketing team um, for our academic business unit. Uh, you know, and but it, it was, I didn't know that I wanted to do that. I just, I saw things that needed to be addressed and I, and I did that. And, and I made sure that it was aligning. I think Claudette, you mentioned this, aligning to what I wanted to spend my time doing and what I want, what, how I wanted to use um, whatever I was good at. And so um, I just, I kept following that. Uh, and then when I did leave to start my company, I wasn't, I didn't have the thought yet that I want to be an entrepreneur. I had the thought that now I've recognized these abilities and these skill sets that I didn't think were being um, acknowledged at my company and there's this problem I wanted to solve because I remember I'm a teacher at heart so this um, gap in education uh, needed to be addressed and the access I mean that 3 p.m to 6 p.m that happens in a child's life is so critical um, and so you know wanted to solve this issue still want to solve this issue and so I, I went after that 
Um, but kind of to your question, Abdul, is, is I, I had to align it. So I was extremely fortunate and privileged that I worked in a corporation for 10 years. So I was able to have savings. So I worked out with my partner, my husband and partner to say, okay, this is, I can, I can go full time for a year and we'll be fine. Um, and acknowledging the, you know, figuring out what sacrifices we'd had to make, figuring out, you know, things with the kids and such. But we looked at that. And so if you can tell, I got a job because a year went by and we didn't bring in the funding. We needed the revenue that we needed. So I have a job now. And I don't, I, I see that as my, the stars aligning and the paths coming together. I'm exactly where I should be. I am um, facilitating, I am teaching, I am still an entrepreneur. I'm, I'm running our real estate company with my partner. So it's, um, it was very, it was calculated in the sense of um, acknowledging my, the risks and acknowledging what I could do and knowing that I, it's okay. It's okay if I have to get a job. Um, I'll add in quickly that we have, you know, we work with so many entrepreneurs and um, uh, they, some of them keep, keep their, day jobs for a long time. And I think that's not, and that should not be seen as a bad thing. That should not be seen as a handicap. Um, this year during 2020, we saw this big, amazing shift from our entrepreneurs and our community pushing back and telling, you know, when, when um, people came to speak at the program and said, we need you all in, we need you to, you know, you know, not be working and we need you this and that. And our founders stood up and said, I, like, I need you to pause. I need you to understand where we're coming from and I'm not going to apply it to your program, not ours, but another program, because this is what we actually need to do. And this is the pathway I'm going to take. And it's just as legit as any other pathway. And I was like, amen, right? Like, yes, like there's so many pathways and finding the organizations and the resources and examples like the panel and the participants here to say there's so many different ways to do it. Um, you can get that support and help to find what's right for you and your family. Okay, so I think we only have five more minutes. I think we have 30 minutes for this. I could talk to you all forever. And I would encourage those of you who have other questions that I didn't get to address, feel free to email them. We will, we, I'm sure that uh, our fearless, amazing, wonderful panelists will be willing to answer the questions as will all of the resources and the folks, the experts at the center. Um, but one last question, I'm actually gonna shift gears on you, Amelia. You can chime in with whatever additional thing you wanted to add about the, um, the, the original question on the table, but really I'm gonna shift gears. I wanna spend this last five minutes just talking about next steps, or in, in my mind, what would you say are the key things that need to happen to, to, to launch your someone's career as an entrepreneur? And there were two questions that I wanna kind of scoop up from the uh, discussion. So this is just a general question about next steps, best, best practices, which, okay, yes, so I'm an entrepreneur. Your, your, your stories have inspired me to believe in myself and to believe that I'm an entrepreneur. Now the question becomes, what do I do? <laughs> What's the next thing that I'm supposed to do? What are words of advice of the next thing I should do? And some of that was about number one, building a network. Like, I mean, how do I even get the bandwidth of people who are interested in what I do? That's one of the direct questions that you might answer by way of answering next steps. But then the second I thought was really interesting is getting over fear. So that risk question embedded in that risk question was a question about, I'm scared, I don't wanna fail, which in my experience, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, you cannot be afraid of failure. <laughs> as my son and as Yoda says, failure is your best teacher. <laughs> But um, what would be some of those next steps? So I'm gonna start with you, Amelia. I'm gonna circle back to you, uh, Claudia, and then I'll come back to you, Brooke. Last five. Great, so those are a lot of questions. I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about the fact that, uh, yes, I think it's right that people should be uh, scared of failure, but there's a caveat to that. Um, you know, CB Insights did some research and found that I think it was like 70 plus percent of businesses that fail, fail because they don't have an authentic demand. They don't have a reason that the, they're, they're no, the solution is not addressing any real problem. So I think when you ask that question about what is my next step, I always ask everybody that comes in my office to talk a little bit about starting a business is like, what problem are you solving? We always start from that. And I think the most important part is also identifying 
who has that problem? So who has that pain? How big and widespread is that problem out there? So I would say the first step is actually to talk to people and talk to a lot of people. So I know there's like, um, you know, uh, a, a term which is get out of the building. I know we're in COVID, it's hard to do, but people actually are very receptive to talk even over Zoom. And you might actually get very lucky talking to people uh, that you couldn't have talked about with before uh, COVID actually. So I would just say start knocking on doors, start asking if you've narrowed down the area that you're trying to start in, right? Start understanding who are these people that you can um, ask, uh, get, get close to them, understand what their journey is, what their path is, where their major pain point is. Uh, and that's where you will start understanding, you know, what, what solution you have for them. You Ideas really are not really the place to start. You know, you might have a thought, but I think we need to take a step back. We need to go back to the designing board, you know, and look at empathetically, like with the, you know, sort of the thinking approach, who really is, how are people suffering from this uh, particular issue? Thank you. Brooke, we have like a minute and then I might give 30 seconds to Claudia after. Yeah, I'm glad to answer questions in the chat. Claudia, if you want to go after it. Yeah, no, um, thank you for that. And I'm also happy to answer any questions um, in the chat or any other time, please feel free to connect with me. Um, I'm in agreement. One of the things that I would strongly suggest is to get connected. If you're thinking about entrepreneurship, get connected. Um, I know that um, this particular platform that we're talking on, if you're here, then this is a great first step. But there's other programs, there's other incubators, there's other things that you can do. Find those resources and get connected with them. And the other thing I would say is to have a plan. Write it out. Um, there's a great website. It's called, um, I think it's called uh, Live Plan that helps you to create your business plan so easily. You just pop in some information. It gives you all the stats. Um, some, some sort of resource like that to help you get your plan out and help you get your thoughts on paper is also the best way to go for any funding or resources. A lot of um, entrepreneurs will try to start up, like you said, Brooke, with a job, and that's totally fine, but there's also so many resources out there right now so many grants, so many uh, government programs and government hubs. I could go on forever um, given that information, but I would certainly start with the plan. Write it out and get connected. Those are my two. I agree. So I'm going to, I will advice. close there first with a heartfelt, deep felt appreciation for all three of you for the amazing advice you've lent and sharing your experiences and your expertise with us. Please, Amelia Brooke, uh, Claudia, if you guys will stick around and just answer some of the Q&A questions that have emerged, I think that we would all benefit. I, I can't wait. I'm chomping at the bit waiting to hear the answers that you'll provide. And uh, with that said, I guess I will turn the floor over to Shannon. Thank you all for participating and we will answer your questions in the Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Brownshree. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, your uh, you're incredibly talented and inspiring. Um, it's, it's amazing for you all to share your stories uh, with us, your opportunities, the challenges, um, and your strength uh, is, is very uh, noticeable and invaluable. And we really, truly appreciate you, you sharing that with us. Next up, we have um, Dr. Jan Triplett. Um, and she is uh, many, many things, including an author, uh, an entrepreneur, and an advocate. Uh, she is the founder and CEO of the award-winning and nationally recognized uh, Business Success Center. She has helped to start, grow, fund, rebuild, and or sell uh, numerous businesses from accounting firms to a private zoo. Uh, she's one of the original founders of the uh, Women's Chamber of Texas. She has served on local and state boards, been a delegate to the White House Conference on Small Businesses, and the Congressional Summit on Small Businesses. She's one of the original founders um, of, again, the Women's Chamber of Texas. And she's received many honors, including being named Texas's Small Business Advocate uh, by the Small Business Administration and the Texas Senate. She's the author of three books, 
uh, including Thinking Big, Staying Small, Easy to be Green, and The Networker's Guide to Success. We're very excited to have her here today, and she will be giving us some tips on how to continue growing our professional networks in a virtual world. Welcome, Dr. Triplett, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Shannon. It's so nice to be here. And actually, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for networking. So thank you very much. So this is the opportunity for all our participants to participate and to begin to network with everyone who's here. Now, you don't have to, but I am going to encourage you a couple of times in the time I have to put your name or your email address or something in the chat box, because in order for people to follow up with you, they need to know how to contact you, right? So if you'll start there, and, and we have the box open so they can do that. Is that right, Shannon? Um, let me double check because we were trying to be able to activate that. Okay. And well, it looks on. like the chat is now open to Good. all. Great. So go Great. for it. I want to make sure that you uh, think about this as we're talking through this, because this is really designed to help you walk away from this session not only with meeting wonderful people and hearing great ideas, but a plan, a takeaway that you can work with. And when I first met Shannon, I met her again because I run something called the Rebuilding Business Weekly Forum. It's not a speech, it's not a webinar. Everybody comes and participates. And so I am so glad to be here because I'm only here because Shannon didn't have somebody. And I said, hi, Shannon. You know, if you can't find somebody, I would be happy to step in. You know, that's okay. It doesn't mean that I feel any less important or, or valued. It means that I reached out to my friend, Shannon, and uh, to uh, Dr. Menefee, and I said, you need somebody? Here I am. Use me if you can. And part of networking, and particularly for women, is this realization that we have something that we're willing to share. And so I want to talk a little bit about what networking is and what it isn't. So I have props. So this is my first prop. This is a net that doesn't have a handle on it, but I use it when I talk about networking because I like it. It's a little green plastic net and you may not be able to see it, but there are little knots at each corner. And the thing about a net is that it keeps things in. It also keeps things out. And when we think about networking, we want to get things to go inside, but we also want to keep things that are not appropriate, not timely, too expensive out. But you know what happens when you cut between the knots? It opens. So you can always get more things in it. So that's my first thing, because when we think about the word network, we have to think about net and we have to think about the other word, which is work. So this is my other prop. No, my dog has not seen this. This is clean. Uh, you could use it if you uh, were afraid of COVID. It is perfectly safe, sanitary. I even you know, sprayed it before I picked it up. So it has colors on it. And the reason that I wanted to show this to you is because there are blue ones and yellow ones and red ones and orange ones. Network doesn't come in just one flavor, one size, but there are three major ones that you can take advantage of, both through uh, being a student or being out in life or going to a store or going online or going to a webinar. And I wanna have you think about them because what I want you to do is think about your goal because we're gonna talk in just a minute about all the different kinds of goals you can have. So the blue ones we're gonna talk about right here are the personal networks that you have and they are the most valuable. They are your friends, they are when you have something terrible that happens or good that happens, they're right there with you and you want to use those appropriately. The yellow ones, those are your business contacts, and those are people you have done business with or are doing business with, even if it were a job when you were little and you sold lemonade or you cut lawns or whatever you did, is all of those business contacts, that's how they see you. And then the third one, these orange ones, we won't leave out the pinks, but we're gonna talk about the orange ones. And the orange ones are really associations. So student organizations you belong to, maybe meetup groups that you participate in, LinkedIn groups, Facebook. Sometimes people think that when we have a pandemic or a bad situation, and I've been in business long enough that I've been through nine downturns. I'm hoping that I'm on a ninth upturn. 
but we we forget that actually the same things that were available to us before the pandemic are still there. They just look different. And so if you think about it, those are the three options you will always have. And I also want to remind everyone that it doesn't matter whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. Now, if you're an introvert, you may think, I don't like to network. I don't like to talk. I just walk around and I don't talk to anybody and I hope people don't look at me and things of that sort. The nice thing about things online, they don't have to see you. You can just write something. And so there are some advantages. And the very first time that I was part of South by Southwest, my friend who's an introvert and I, um, we proposed an idea to do a program called Networking for Introverts. And I'm an extrovert. She was an introvert. And I thought to myself, what if nobody shows up? Everybody showed up. It was standing room only. And the reason is because if you are an introvert, boy, do you have a lot to give. And networking is all about giving as well as taking. And we sometimes forget that because sometimes we think that networking is prospecting or we think that networking is mentoring. It isn't. Networking is its own thing. And women know about networking because if you've ever made cookies and discovered that you didn't have enough eggs, you went next door or you called somebody and you said, I will give you a cookie for an egg. That's a trade. Networking is all about trading. So what have you got to trade? So what I'd like you to do is to start putting in the chat box, if you're willing to, I said I would nag you a little bit a couple of times. I used to be the editor of a magazine called The Networker, and so I'm a very good mag, is to remind you to please, if you feel comfortable, please do put in the chat box your name, what you do, how to contact you, and I want you to think about your goals. So I want to do this little list that is a list of 25 different ways that I have used networking. Because we think about networking, well, I just want to meet people. And when people would say that to me, I said, okay, you open the door and you walk in the door and you shake hands and somebody, I met you, right? That doesn't do you much good. So we want to think about what we really want out of it. And networking is all about goals. So here are some of the goals that I was able to accomplish. And if you think about my list, maybe there's one of these that you would like. So I found a job. I found love. I got control and independence and freedom because I started a business. I got information. And all through the time that I have been in business, I got all kinds of information, things that helped me avoid mistakes, things that uh, I needed to know that I could pass along to my networks to, to make me more valuable because part of networking is demonstrating your value and feeling valuable. Uh, I got access to funds and uh, I was asked to speak a couple of years ago about uh, access to capital. And I thought, well, how many ways really are there? We think about debt and equity. Actually, there are 101 ways that you can fund a business if you don't have to have dollars that you put in somebody else's bank. You have to be creative. And that's what networking is all about. One of the other things I got is avoid mistakes. One of the um, places that I used to take meetings uh, and uh, hold meetings had a bad habit of, if you weren't on time, uh, getting out. The catering manager would come and flip the light switch on and off. Guess how many people told everybody they could, don't go there because they will shut the lights off on you. The uh, hotel doesn't exist anymore. So you can avoid mistakes. You can make a very big difference. Uh, to make sure that people get paid, don't work with them because they don't pay on time, do work with them because they pay extra, all kinds of things that are valuable to you. The feeling of not being alone. And when we are in this kind of situation where we are, it can feel very lonely and as if it's never going to change. I've been around long enough to tell you, I guarantee it'll change. It won't be the same because it's always different, but in a way that that's good. I have met some remarkable people. And some of those remarkable people were people I thought, well, you know, they'll never talk to me. Um, Michael Gerber wrote The E-Myth. I've always liked the book. He and I don't agree on everything, but I thought I would like to interview him and I have a program that I'd love him to come. Picked up the phone. I said, this is who I am. You don't know me from Adam. Would you do it? Sure, he did. 
And so there are lots of times where we are reluctant, even as extroverts, to do things when there are just marvelous people out there, like this wonderful panel, uh, like Dr. Wagam and Dr. Menifee and uh, Amy Roundtree and, and everybody who's here, who's really eager to talk to you, but you have to take the first step and you have to put your name and your address or something in the chat box so that we can know and be willing to allow us and to contact you and for you to contact us. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, uh, please contact me. I love to have more people because it extends my network. Not only have I gotten lots of interesting people to talk to, but I've learned a lot. And over the years I've been in business, I, I am pre-internet. Uh, I was also pre-self-improvement um, books in terms of writing them, you know, uh, and uh, so I learned how to do that because I had five days before I gave a speech and I wanted to have a book. So I had a friend teach me how to do this so that I could print a book, learn how to do that into making a booklet, and presto changeo, in five days I had the speech, I had the book because of my network, and you can do that too. So you can also not be bored because when you have a network and you use them and you don't feel, well, I have to do it all. We're talking about delegation here. So a lot of networking is delegation techniques that you need as a good manager, but you can certainly have an opportunity to meet and, and hear about things that you've never thought of or you've never heard of. And those are wonderful opportunities. And what Dr. Elam was talking about, being a practical optimist really helps to be a networker. You really need to do that. And it doesn't matter on the age. So many of the, the people and the pictures that you've seen today may be younger than you are. Maybe you're not that old. Maybe you're all, like me, you're a lot older. I've been in business. This is my 40th year uh, in business. Uh, I have a family business. I am in business with my husband. We are still married. 40 years later. So you can find love, you can travel, all kinds of things that happen because you're interested in others. And I have a couple of books to share with you. One is called Small is Beautiful by Schumacher because I really believe that smaller businesses, they're not only the engine, the economic engine, but they make a huge difference. And they're a lot of fun because you get to make some decisions. Intrapreneuring, now these are older books, but there's a lot of good stuff in them. This is Intrapreneuring by Gifford Pinchot. And the reason is because a lot of people these days are gig workers or whatever euphemistically you wanna call it. Sometimes we call them freelancers. There is an organization called the Texas Freelancers Association. It's not just for graphics people. It's not just for artists, IT people belong. It's people who really are more like project managers who go from project to project and it's okay. And it's okay to have something that you're not there for two years or six months, that you're really getting this opportunity to learn things and do things that are exciting. Uh, you certainly get rescued. Um, some of you might have tried to look me up and found that my website doesn't work. That's because I was attacked. Uh, everybody gets attacked at some point. And I went to my friend, Ada, uh, Dr. Ada Maddy, and I said, help. <laughs> and so he said, okay, Here's what you need to do. You need to find a company. I said, Ada, I know you. Will you do it? No, I won't do it. You have to find it. So I went to another friend, Lindsay. I said, Lindsay, I don't want to do it. Ada doesn't want to do it. Who do you know? And so by using that network, I'm still working through the process, but I'm closer. And I hope that you will come back and find me again. So be putting that in, your, in the information of what you want, what is your goal, and how to contact you. So what have we got in there, Shannon? that people might like to know, how do I do this? Yes, definitely. We've got quite a few people that are, are just looking for some of those hard, tangible things. And um, certainly attending events like this uh, and, and just what you said, putting yourself out there, sharing that information, sharing yourself and opening yourself up um, you know, is, is a good way to build that network. And for those of you who are also out there, um, you know, while you are in college, is a great time to start the process of building your professional network. It's very different than your um, personal network. I love what you say about it's not a, uh, it's, it's both a give and a take, um, a, a sharing of those things. For a job, put a note yeah. in the chat box. I'm looking for a job. 
if you're looking for an introduction to somebody who can buy something from you, put that in the chat box. So I'm going to start because I promised uh, Dr. Wyman that I would talk about how do you find a job? Well, the question is, what do you have to give me as a business owner? So if you say, I don't think I have anything, come talk to me. You have a lot to offer, I promise you. But you wanna couch it in terms that mean something to a business owner. And a small business owner is gonna be looking for something very different than a larger business. And those of us who are smaller businesses understand that you don't know everything. We don't want you to know everything because we wanna train you ourselves. But if you're looking for a job, is think about it from what you can give to that person that's not the things you did, but what you accomplished. Because we want, as business owners, we want people who did accomplish things, not that you know how uh, to use WordPress. Although knowing WordPress is very helpful. But. I have one quick question that I wanted to uh, give to you that came in through the, the Q&A. Um, when interviewing for a job, how uh, do employers usually react when you are an entrepreneur or a small business owner? Um, this person, uh, we've got Tiffany, she's curious about if, if they would view it as a negative because they would worry that as an employee, they may not be focused. Can you talk a little bit about that? We only have uh, about a minute or two left and we need to wrap yes. it up and say goodbye. No but problem. Go for it. Please contact me if you've got questions and I didn't answer. Being a business owner makes you a terrible employee. I have to tell you the truth. Do we look at you as if you won't focus? No, we might worry that you might steal everything from us. But if you do your networking and you find the people because there are yeses, nos, and maybes, it, you, there is no universal. Use your network to find out more about that company, but that person, because business owners, even if there's a, 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 a nonprofit, are very much involved in people they like and they trust. And if they feel that you have done your homework and gotten to know them and said, I know you don't normally do this, or I know that you frequently do this, which is what you really want, then apply there. Don't go to places where they say, well, if you're uh, not an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, I don't want you. Do your homework, use your network, you will succeed. Thank you so much, Shannon, for inviting me to do this. This has been so much fun. And I love all of you all for all the great information that you've shared. And I look forward to seeing more of you connected to me. Thanks. Always. Thank you very much, Dr. Triplett. All right. That is coming close to the end of our uh, kickoff today, but and we've heard from some absolutely amazing women. Um, I am super excited to tell you that this is not the end of the event, but really the beginning. Um, because we will be continuing this community dialogue and sharing founder stories um, through weekly interviews uh, that, that we're conducting with startup founders and other inspiring entrepreneurs. Over the next few weeks, we will hear from, here's just a, a glimpse at some of the founders that we'll be hearing from, many of them who participated in Div Inc. Um, accelerator programs, including uh, Isis Ashford. She's the co-founder and COO of Explosion Technologies, who's developing wearable sensor technology for athletes uh, to train smarter and faster. There's also Christina Rogers, uh, the COO and co-founder of Raven's Eye, which is a company that is designing technology and tools for blind and visually impaired individuals. Uh, Adriana Cantu, she's the founder and CEO of Revealix, which is a company using mobile imaging and remote patient monitoring to prevent diabetic foot wounds and amputations. Um, there is Tarika Navarro, the founder of Kin Home, who where, is making home essentials that cultivate movement towards a slower, simpler way of living. And Darsha Ham the COO and co-founder of Melanoid Exchange. They're providing education and community for Black-owned consumer product good companies. So these are just a glimpse of some of the uh, founders that I'm going to be interviewing and will be sharing. And we look forward to these and more. They'll be coming out onto our website, www.innovation.txstate.edu, and uh, also being shared via email or on our Twitter. But before we end today, I really want to say thank you 
uh, to all of our speakers and of course our sponsors, the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and all of those who are participating in the CIE and to Brooke and to Div Inc. Your, your participation in this event has been immeasurable and greatly appreciated. I'd like to also say thank you to all of our organizing team, which includes Dr. Jennifer Irvin, Dr. Jana Minifee, both of whom are the leaders of the NSF i team at Texas State. Uh, Dr. Gloria Martinez Ramos, she is the director of the Center for Diversity and Gender Studies at Texas State, uh, and Dr. Claudia Rochman, who is the associate director for entrepreneurship. And again, thank you to the, our provost, Dr. Jean Bourgeois, to also Dr. Walt Horton, who's the chief research officer for their continued support of the CIE and a, a special thank you to our IT support team and to Chris Stampley in McCoy College of Business for his video editing experience. Like I said, today is not the end of the event, it's just the beginning. So I hope you will join us um, every week for the Women Entrepreneurship Founder Series. So until next time, goodbye and thank you for being with us today.